Howdy everyone, I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and this is all part of my course that I'm making available to the public on machine learning with a focus on subsurface spatial problems. We are talking in this section about tuning hyperparameters, and so let's dive into talking about model goodness metrics. So when we're performing testing, we are tuning the hyperparameters and it requires us to assess model performance. We really need to know the goodness of the suite of models, each of the individual models in the suite of models that are representing the variable degree of complexity or the variable degree of different hyperparameters used with respect to the testing data that was withheld. There are a variety of metrics that we could apply for this assessment. Uh, the main choice or the most important factor likely will be whether or not we're dealing with classification, the response feature is categorical, or regression, the response feature is continuous. We'll, rec we'll cover the regression metrics first and then we'll go to the classification metrics for goodness of model. Now there should be no surprise at all here because we're going to have the same type of metrics here that we've been using for the purpose of formulating our loss functions for the purpose of training our parameters of our models before. So we have mean squared error and we may use root mean squared error if we want to be in the original units. And it's an L2 norm. It's going to be sensitive to large errors. And the way we calculate it is the test mean squared error is just the average over the testing samples of the square difference between the truth withheld and the estimates that come from the model. Y hat is an estimate I in indexed over one through n test data. Now, we acknowledge the fact that this will be sensitive to large errors, but that could be a very good thing. You might think that those larger errors should be more important and we want a measure of goodness that's going to show them. It's going to be showing, um, having a large impact from them. It might be a good idea. Mean absolute error is the L1 norm equivalent. It'll be less sensitive to large errors. You might deem that that's better to use because you're not as interested in those big errors. You want more of an aggregate over all of the errors over all of the testing data. And so the equation for calculating the L1 norm for over testing data is shown right here. The test mean absolute error, excuse me, I'd made a mistake there in the notation, but I've got it now. So variance explained is another measure that's often used for goodness of the model. It's the proportion of the variance of the response feature that's captured by the model. Now it's, it's cool. It takes advantage of the additivity of variance. The total variance is equal to the variance explained plus the variance not explained. And you can work that out through expectation. Really fun to do. Now, so the variance explained is shown right here. If you look at it, there's no surprises. It's a typical variance calculation. We're simply taking the average of the squared difference over the testing data of the estimates from the model centered or subtracting out the mean of the response feature. And the variance not explained is going to be the average of the truth values of the response minus the predictions from our model, the residual, the residual. And if we go ahead and we put them together, the R squared is the variance explained over the variance explained plus the variance not explained. That's the variance explained over the total variance. It's a ratio between zero and one of how much of the variance is being captured by your model. Ah, pretty useful stuff. That's pretty good stuff. Okay, class problems will have their own testing metrics to work with. And so here's a couple examples. And so to demonstrate this, I've drawn just a schematic right here, but I'll show a real example up above. So let's just go through this. Confusion matrix, it's a nice complete measure. It, it's showing you the matrix with the categories that you're working with. And so we might have three different categories, one, two, three, one, two, three, of the truth versus the predicted. This is the truth. This is what was predicted. So in this cell, we're seeing that 
We predicted category one and the truth was category one. We predicted category one and the truth was category two and so forth. And so we can visualize and diagnose all of the combinations of correct and correct and incorrect or misclassifications within our classification model. That's pretty useful. Perfect accuracy would simply be a matrix for which we have on the diagonals the total number of samples that belong to each category. Category 1, 2, and 3, and these would all be zeros, no misclassifications. Now, I show an example right here. This is actually based on a naive Bayes classification model, which will be shown in the uh, subsequent lecture we'll be covering shortly. Here's the decision boundary right here. We have porosity versus brittleness, low production, high production wells, black is the testing data that have high production, white testing data with low production, and you can see the misclassifications that went on with the model, the black samples, testing samples that are in the purple region would be a misclassification, and the two whites right here. So what we can see overall is the this matrix right here, 26, 21, correct lows, correct high production. And we had one case where we predicted low production, but in fact, the truth was high production. And we had a case where we, two cases where we predicted high and it was low production. And those are those examples right here. These are values that are, in fact, the truth is low, but our model would have predicted high. That's the two. And one right here, which is in fact high, but we would have predicted it being low. Now I put a matrix right here just, just to provide a larger example, but of course it will be a K by K matrix where K is the number of classes that we're working with. Okay, so there's of course other testing metrics we can work with for classification or categorical response features. We can also do use summarizations based on the confusion matrix. Precision is a cool one. This is the number of true positives divided by the total number of positives, the true positives plus the false positives. And so in this example right here, and of course you'll have a precision for each K for the low category in this example right up here, the true positives for low are 26 times that we said it's low and it was low. The false positives are times that we said it was low, but it wasn't low. We did that once. So this ratio right here, and if you go ahead and check, that's actually equal to 96%. And that's the output directly from using scikit-learn metrics to calculate it for this problem. I use it in the workflow later on. You'll see it when we do naive base. Recall is the number of true positives for that category over the total number of testing samples in that category. So that would be, we had 226 true positives, but in the truth data set, we in fact had 26 plus two that were misclassified. That's a total number of low cases. So this will be 26 divided by 28. Okay, so that's recall. Now people decided recall and precision both matter. You're worried about both of these ratios. And so they said, let's just go ahead and do the harmonic average of both of them, precision and recall for each one of the categories. And that gives you the F1 score. And you can, you can confirm that the F1 score would be from these two numbers would be this right here. Okay, so this has been a very short discussion of the types of metrics that we can use to assess goodness of a model. Now, there's many more I could have talked about, and they will come up as we get into other machine learning methods, but I do think this is a pretty good foundation. Well, I hope that this was helpful to you. I am Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I record and share all of my lectures at the hope that they'll help working professionals and students alike in my class, and those who graduate and move on, and even students who are just students of life and informally learning, and we all do all the time. So I hope this was helpful, and um, take care. I'll see you next one.